वेलकम फ्रेंड्स टू दिस आफ्टरनून सेशन आई सेड आई विल टेल यू अ सीक्रेट द सीक्रेट इज इफ वी हैव वोर्न ऑल दीज कवर्स अपॉन आवर सेल्स वी हैव वर्चुअली ट्रैप्ड आवर सेल्स ए फ्रेंड ऑफ माइन had a first time experience of leaving the body in meditation first of all was very frightened it's going to die had to be reassured you don't die leaving the body when came back into the body first time felt i am trapping myself that's not me it's a big trap to be trapped into one body where you can't even fly you can't do anything it's a terrible situation were we not intelligent enough to make arrangements to end this when we like we did and the secret is that we made an arrangement which is called the occurrence of coincidences coincidences happen in our life they are not accidents we meet another human being created by ourselves at the right time when we want to exit and that other human being looks like having something more than we have that he has realized that he has reached the level where we want to reach that he knows what the soul is and we begin to believe that and yet it's our creation how does he come into our life pure coincidence coincidence works all the time and people have told me once they come on a spiritual path the coincidences increase i was talking to you today everything is unreal but has been made into a reality how many of you like chocolates <laughs> wow did you know they are unreal i'll tell you coincidence somebody sent me a packet of chocolates today he says unreal <laughs> what better coincidence do you like <laughs> these happen all the time these coincidences the secret is that when we are ready to go it is not meditation that takes us it is the discovery of another person who takes us by means which is not available to the mind not to the sense perceptions not to the body when we meditate any kind of meditation and i have tried several kinds in my own life all meditation is done with the mind you can't hope to transcend the mind by using the mind the mind holds you back within itself because every meditation with mind is with effort can you all hear me every meditation we do is with our effort i want to meditate the i never goes away in meditation there no meditation that you can try without saying i am meditating the i does not go there is no effort that we can make in any area of life where the i can go away the ego can go away ego is the face of the mind therefore we are trapped by the mind much more than we are trapped with the body this trap of the mind is impossible to get out of by using the mind therefore i found out over the course of my whole life having tried so many kinds of meditations it's unbelievable if i start reciting to you no meditation can take us beyond the mind they are all done with the mind what takes us beyond the mind is what lies beyond the mind thoughts are in the mind decision making in the mind one thing is not in the mind when you fall in love there is no mind it just pulls you love is one thing that pulls you without thought 
लव इज वन पुल्स यू दैट्स हैज ए स्पॉन्टिनेटी ए टाइमलेस फीचर इन इट दैट नो थिंकिंग हैज देर फोर वॉट पुल्स अस बियॉन्ड द माइंड इज एन एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ इंटेंस प्योर लव अकरिंग एट ए लेवल हायर देन द माइंड एंड वेन वी आर रेडी टू गो बियॉन्ड द माइंड such a human being appears in our life who gives us that experience of love and we call that human being a perfect living master we use these words carefully perfect living master perfection is beyond the mind all mind is imperfect because all mind's method of realizing anything is by analysis by division by separation by putting apart where has love joins love puts together is exactly different different from any mental activity love pulls us therefore when perfect living masters come here they do not come to teach us any meditation they do not come to teach us anything they pull us with the love but we approach them with our mind with our sense perception with our body therefore they function for a time for a little while in response to what we are doing we are approaching them with their bodies they approach us with their body they take care of us and they talk to us at a physical level they talk what have you eaten i can give you some prashad they are blessed food as if the blessed food is going to take you to your true home no food has ever taken anybody anywhere <laughs> except sometimes hospitals <laughs> eat too much <laughs> therefore it's not something physical at all but they live at the physical level with us why so that they can be our friends true friends there is no greater truth in friendship like a friendship with a perfect living master there is no greater love that you can experience no greater love that i have ever experienced except with my master baba savan singh whose picture is here why what's the difference what we call love generally speaking is merely attachment in attachment in the experience of attachment the i never goes away somebody is constantly telling me i love you i love you i know instantly he loves i more than you he is putting i ahead of you and apart from the words it's not a question of words his mind is telling him that he as one individual is doing something for somebody else the two remain distinct the duality never ends in attachments in love you forget yourself the beloved takes your place that's the one experience that puts you together there are some other experiences also love is primal experience beyond the mind intuition is another one when you get intuitive awareness it defies your mind it defies your reason it defies your thinking and you say no how can that be but i just feel like it where are you feeling from where does an intuitive feeling come from a person has to go on a on a trip tomorrow he made the booking on the plane something says don't travel tomorrow risky where the risk there is no risk at all why is my some some kind of intuition telling me don't go mind says you made the program everything is normal every time you have been traveling traveling for years what happened to what is going to happen tomorrow i will go most of the time we reject intuition because of our dependence on reason dependence on logic we use logic and reason reject intuition next day accident happens and we say oh this was the reason why that feeling came to me is the source of intuition different than the source of knowledge that the mind has of course it's very different the mind operates on data available to it right in front next date says oh i wish i had known that 
because that was not in front of the mind. Mind works on very limited data. Intuition comes from the entire data stored in the mind for millions of years. It, the source of intuition is very different. And when you are able to go beyond the mind in an experience inside, within yourself, you discover the nature of intuition and love. They come directly from the spirit, the soul, the consciousness per se, not the mind. <clears throat> Imagine you can discover yourself through love, love and devotion. I always add another word to it. I should stop at love. But I say love and devotion. Why do I bring another word in it? Because when you experience real love, devotion comes automatically as a response. People become devotees, not by planning to be devotees. They become devotees when they are touched by that love, touched by something. Something happens inside. It can be intuitive. It can be blissful, it can be sudden blissfulness, it can be sudden intuition, sudden love, and you become devoted. It can happen anytime. We are all endowed with that wonderful way to become devoted. All we need is just an experience of real love. Therefore, the secret of going beyond the mind is not meditation, but being ready to experience love, real love, unconditional love, unconditional to the extent that somebody can come and say, I love you and expresses love, shows love. And you say, but I hate you. And that person still loves you. You say, I'm going to kill you. Person still loves you. You kill that person, he still loves you. That's called unconditional love. I have not seen that except in a perfect living master. A perfect living master is aware. His awareness is total. His awareness is that we are all coming from the same source. He doesn't see any distinction. Supposing you have one glimpse of that state of yours, that you are the spirit, that that's what is real nature of yourself. You added on mind for a variety of experiences. You added sense perceptions to create the depth of so solid spatial experiences, time experiences. You added the body to make it a solid experience, a physical solid experience. Just add-ons to make the experience a greater variety of experiences. And then you discover who you really are. It is not possible for you then not to love everybody. Because everybody is yourself. People sometimes say, we are all one, but I don't like that person. <laughs> How are we all one? It's not a, it's not a, <laughs> it's just a statement to make. The experience comes beyond the mind. And our ability to reach the mind is reached when we are tired of other things. First step, if we are not tired of this world, we are not ready yet. Enjoy. If somebody comes to me and says, I am having a good time and why should I do meditation? Why should I follow you? I say, no, no, don't follow me at all. Enjoy. When you are tired, come to me. <laughs> and he comes to me next week. <clears throat> One man came to me. Actually, true, true st story. He came to me. He said, I have been seeing you on YouTube. And I see that you are telling people to discover themselves by going inside. It's such a waste of time to discover yourself. Then what happens? We are still living here. Life is still the same. And in any case, a person like me, I have been very successful in business. I have a beautiful large house. I have all the money I need. And I have a new car I just bought. All the facilities that are provided to a successful person, I have them all. I am very happy. Why should I try to find out who I am and who I am not? I said, my friend, you have no need to find out. You just enjoy your car. 
enjoy your house enjoy your money go and enjoy and don't come to me again because you are not a candidate for what i am sharing with people next week he was back <laughs> he said i am suffering so much i said what happened in one week <laughs> you were so happy what happened my wife ran away i didn't mention that last week <laughs> she ditched me she betrayed me the emotional hurt i have makes me my house look like a monstrous thing my money looks useless i can't get anything with that money i am so badly hurt tell me what i should do i said meditate <laughs> <laughs> we all have life that is full of high and low physical life does not come without high and low if this was all high then another place where we could be is called heaven it exists in the astral plane in your imaginative selves which is only sense perceptions you have another place you can visit many places in meditation you can visit those places even now that there are heavens and hells if you all the good things were happening all your good deeds were there they were all rewarded yeah they are rewarded by a law that's prevailing here called law of cause and effect law of karma and you would be in heaven if all was bad you would be in hell but if it's a combination you become a human being so that's why human beings have highs and lows i have not met anybody who said all my life was horrible all my life was heavenly they all have had periods of happiness and periods of unhappiness period of success period of failure they all had pain pleasure both combination so that is why this life has both but at a certain point it begins to look that there is more pain than pleasure actually it's pretty balanced but doesn't look like that and what's the reason for feeling this is not my place this is too painful this is not it's got too many problems why does the negative feature of life appear to prevail over the positive feature if they are well distributed the reason is the nature of time time is of two kinds now i'm quoting a very big scientist but i'll name him afterwards time is the one that goes on the clocks and the watches and time that you experience when you are having good time time goes very fast when you are having bad time time slows down one author writing about time says that what is suffering suffering is one long moment when one moment looks too long you are suffering if an hour looks like 15 minutes you are having good time if 15 minutes looks like an hour you are not having good time is that what they call imaginary time is the time you are experiencing not the clock time nobody experiences clock time we go by calendars and clock times and experience our imaginary time who has used this word imaginary time a great scientist who recently died stephen hawking Stephen Hawking last interview he gave with Tyson you can read the interview he has been trying to understand from a scientist point of view how this world came into being he was the one who first talked of a black hole that a black hole contains all the mass everything with no volume no time and space and yet it can expand in time and space and maybe this universe is a big bang creation of one of those singularities for where it came but then he said before it came was was there all his life he thought there was nothing there was no time so what nothing could be there it was nothing all the time he said all his life there nothing before the big bang there was nothing he said nothing must also have nothing has to be there for something to happen there in the last interview he says i think there was imaginary time and the calendar time which we measure 13.6 billion years is the clock time 
imaginary time pre-existed. First time, such a big scientist has said, use the word imaginary time being more real than clock time. Because of this nature of time that we experience, and good things happen fast, slow things, bad things happen slow, it looks like bad things are happening. And Guru Nanak, the great Sikh mystic said, the whole world is unhappy. Only those are happy who are in touch with their own self, their nam, the sound within. So that is why we feel, when we feel this is not our life, we had enough of it. We are tired, we are ready. We are ready for a spiritual path. We are ready for going and discovering our true self. And then at that's the time when the coincidence happens. Unreal chocolates. <laughs> that's the time when a person appears in our life. A person whom we cannot find. Teachers we can find. Teachers, there are so many teachers teaching the same spirituality, same things. Thousands of books, maybe millions of books are written today containing the same information. Oh, it's all within you. Kingdom of God is within you. All religions talking like that. Books talking like that. Teachers talking like that. Giving sermons every day. Giving lectures every day. Perhaps this lecture is one of those two. We get lectures all the time about what the truth is. But we don't get it. Something is happening inside us at that state, which makes us seek. Seeking takes place inside us. Now, seeking is very different from searching. We spend 99% of our life searching, very little seeking. Searching takes place with our thinking, with our mind. Searching is what we think exists and therefore we want to find out. Seeking is the unknown. We don't know what it is, but there's something we want to know, but we don't know what it is. That seeking that takes place is not in the mind. It's in the spirit. The seeking, like intuition, like love, originates in the spirit, not in the mind. When you are a seeker, you will find. As simple as that. If you seek within yourself, and you feel the seeking inside, that perfect living master appears. He may appear after several teachers have appeared in your life. Because the mind keeps on saying, you have to find for yourself. You have to work on it. You can get nothing in this world without struggle and working for it. Effort. Effort is necessary. So you are making all the effort. Very often in our life, when effort has failed, that a perfect living master appears. But the mind still wants to be taught. So temporarily, a perfect living master who has not come to teach becomes a temporary teacher and begin to do the same thing other teachers are doing. But after a while, you find the teaching is not what is pulling me. What's pulling me is some un uncanny kind of love. It hits me somewhere inside. It doesn't... I can't make full sense of it, but I can feel it. When that kind of love pulls us, we are drawn to the Master. And he says, it's not meditation that will take you anywhere. Haven't you tried it? Master, I have tried it for 40 years, and I saw some spark sparkling of lights here and there. I didn't go anywhere. You can't go anywhere. It's only love that will pull you. And when love pulls, we become devotees. Love and devotion is a secret. What actually happens? Because we are knowing that the secret is inside, we are trying to meditate before this happens. Therefore, we discover that what we thought was a human being outside of ourselves was pulling us. The same human being appears inside us and pulls us from inside. And we realize, after some time, that the outside was merely an image, subjectively created, inside was the real image of the Master. Then what happens? 
when he pulls us beyond the mind beyond the causal level beyond the causal body of the mind alone mind and spirit alone when he pulls us beyond that we discover the master that we saw was our own higher self at the end there is only one there is no difference between what we thought was another being and ourselves they are the same this discovery changes everything that we made our own arrangement this is all our own arrangement arrangement of consciousness of the spirit that let you have all the experiences you want at any level grand experiences when you want to come back you can be pulled back with all this arrangement that has been made it's no more than an arrangement it's no more if the world is unreal how can a master be a, a real in the middle of it is equally unreal we are projecting the master as much as we projecting the rest of the world the real master we are projecting is from the inner state but we think maybe he is also from the same state where our mind is projecting everything else when we reach that point yes he is there but unless the pull comes from beyond that we do not discover that he and the self are the same this is the top most secret there is only one self one total self it is total consciousness is the ability of the self to be conscious of anything whatever it becomes conscious of becomes creation and creation is taking place at so many levels because of the self what i am sharing with you today is what great master jur maharaj baba savan singh ji whose photo you see here shared with me and he told me that what he is sharing with me has worked with him hope it will work with me but he said if you can find something better take it but please do me one favor come back to me and tell me what it is i'll also take it he threw such an open challenge that i took him very seriously and i said let me first explore everything else i wouldn't have tried all the yogas and all kinds of meditation strange kind of meditations strange kind of i followed every religion got converted to every religion that i could find just to discover if i can find something better than what he gave only after several years when i couldn't find anything better i told him i couldn't find and i got a serious work which i thought i was doing at the end i found master is my real self he is doing it i am just going through the moves of this he put me through so many grills and so much life and ups and downs everything just to show me how the whole system works how creation comes into being it's amazing and i am sharing with you now you all have that capacity you have come here because you are seekers you wouldn't be here otherwise you are seeking the same thing that i was seeking we are co travelers on the same path that is why i gave you this trouble to come even on difficult days of travel to come and join me so i can share these teachings with you i understand that some of you sent some questions i'll pick up a few questions and answer them now <clears throat> what is the spiritual and karmic penalty for drinking one glass of wine <laughs> <laughs> what is the spiritual and karmic penalty for drinking one glass of wine maybe you have to drink two again that's how the law of karma operates the law of karma is a law of cause and effect it just happens to be a law we do not realize that we have been here for a long time because we don't remember our memory is very short we can't even remember what happened a few years ago we can't remember what breakfast we had a few weeks ago our memory is very short but if we could improve our memory 
if we would go back inside and see our memory, we have been here for a very long time. And what perpetuates our being here is this law. It's just a law to create this experience. The law of karma is very simple. That at the causal level, we laid down a timeline and added space to it. First created time, past, present and future. Said there are infinite number of years behind, infinite number of years ahead. And here are these uh, events that we are going to place on this timeline. And we connected one with the other by this principle of cause and effect. It was a good move. And once we did that, we are now time traveling, all of us. The, the Greeks and the uh, Egyptians were not much better than us. We are time traveling at the same pace. They time travel faster. As I said in the morning, we will also start traveling faster when we like. There is another universe existing, which you can go and watch at the causal level, where people are having a gadget. They are just technological advancement. We have a gadget where they can move in time as they can move in space. Because really, if time-space is the same continuum, this bothered scientists. Why is the arrow pointing only in one direction here? If in space, I can go there and come back, why can't I go tomorrow and come back to today? It should be the same. Einstein said time-space is a single continuum. It's not separate. We should be able to do both. We are able to do both. But we have not yet found the physical means of doing it. We still have internal means of doing it. So when we find the timeline is placed like that, the events are placed, just a design of creation. And therefore, we put cause and effect. And then we added something called good and bad. So that we can give different values, high and low made life into a sine curve, high and low, high and low. And once that was done, we said, this is something bad we are doing, this is something good we are doing. If we are doing bad, the result is punishment. If we are doing good, the result is reward. So the whole timeline became punishment and reward. And since the whole thing has been set up by the mind, we create good and bad with our mind and we store that information so when we do a lot of good, we wait for the reward and we die in the physical body. It's very limited time. We have to come back for the reward. If we do bad, we have to wait for the punishment and we come back for the punishment. So this has perpetuated us. So what has happened really is since this storage of an event is not the action, but the intention to perform an action, and we are making intentions so many times without acting on, upon it, the storage is still working with those intentions. So we create karma by intention, not by action. Since we make so many intentions, we create so much karma, in one short lifetime, in a hundred years, we can create enough karma to last for a million years. Every day we are creating good intentions, bad intention, good intention. I can, I, I hate him. I want to kill him. No, I won't kill him. Okay. Karma, <laughs> karma stored. I don't like that person. I don't want this. Karma stored. Oh, I love that person. I'll do anything for that person. Karma stored. So this storage is so huge that this makes this prison house of being continually being reborn to go through this law of karma is almost perpetual, forever. Nobody can say, I am going to do very good karma this time and get out of this mess. You know, you'll be back to get all the rewards for it. You go to heaven maybe. I am going to do whatever I like. There is no second life. Okay, you'll get rewarded. Then you'll say, wish I had done, wish I had been more intelligent. But you didn't remember anything. So this whole idea of forgetfulness in coming again and continuing with the same karmic pattern is perpetuating our stay here. It's in the middle of it 
that the seeking can come and get us out on a predetermined time. In this time frame, we have determined that also in advance, when we'll get out. During this time, we are making our own decisions. One glass of wine might take me for one hour to hell. Will two glasses also take one hour or two hours? If the mind says two hours, you go two hours. The mind says one hour, you go one hour. It's the mind creating the karma and mind creating the reward and punishment. And what is, what, how does the mind create this value system, this morality? It creates by being placed already in a society, in an experience of other people, in experience of parents growing up, experience of schools, experience of jobs, experience of friends and family, experience of foes and enemies. All the experiences add up to create a moral code in our head. There is no uniform moral code. Moral codes have changed both over time and place. In this world, same thing the good in one place, bad in another. In our own life, something the good at one time, bad at another. Therefore, there is no single moral code. The moral code is being sustained by your external experiences. And that code determines the punishment and reward. And our mind stores it and then it creates the events. And we follow those events on the timeline according to that. So, I would suggest, if you don't want a spiritual and karmic penalty, Take a non-alcoholic wine. <laughs> yes. After a disciple attains enlightenment, how does that disciple's desires and vision toward life change? Or what happens after enlightenment in the physical life? After a disciple attains enlightenment, how does th that disciple desires and vision towards life change? Or what happens after enlightenment in the physical life? It depends on the state of awareness you reach in enlightenment. Enlightenment has different meanings for different people. We use the word enlightenment as if we are being pulled out of darkness into light. That's where the word enlightenment came from. That we are in darkness, that means we can't see. And then we can see. If you can see something you can't see now, you are enlightened. It depends on how far you are enlightened. Supposing you are enlightened to the fact that this body is not real. But you are real elsewhere. Your sense perceptions are real. You will look at this world as unreal. And it has been created into reality. You will have a wonderful experience. You will not be worried so much. Because you will see it's not real. But you will be affected by the drama. You can cry. You are crying because what you are watching, what you are seeing. But you are not worried in the same sense. So worry disappears first. If you are more enlightened and can see the whole... Drama is being generated from your minds. You are happy to watch the show. You, then you can be happy all the time. And if you have achieved a true enlightenment of discovering your own self, which is beyond the mind, we discover what the unit of consciousness which we call the soul or spirit is, then you are happy all the time. Just to see how this has been generated and how you are going through it with that enlightenment. And if you are fully enlightened at the level of a perfect living master, you discover the whole show is taking place in your true home at one place. There is no place or time. Everything is happening in a singularity. Everything is happening in one state, in oneness, in one total consciousness. Not that you have come away anywhere. Everything is there. Very big difference in that enlightenment. When we are enlightened by stages, first enlightenment is we are physical, but intellectually we understand 
that maybe this is not real. Something else can be real. We haven't experienced it, but we understand it, which is the first step. When we understand it, we feel a little better that maybe there is something better that can come if I try hard enough, if I meditate more, maybe I can get something. So it changes your life and you are not as worried and as involved in the ups and downs as before. If you are having an actual experience, then when you have that experience, you have to shut off this experience because it won't become real till you shut off this experience. When we go to sleep and have a dream at night, dream only becomes real because we don't know where we are sleeping. We have to shut off the experience of wakeful state in order for the dream to become real. And we have to make the dream unreal to make the wakeful state real. If we are going to make the next state real, we have to shut this off. Therefore, that looked like the only real state. That this was the only real state. That was like a dream. Our physical life was like a dream. When we come back to the physical level, that looked like a dream. Maybe it's a very lucid dream. This is only reality. When we go to still higher level, that becomes the only reality. All others look dreamlike. Which means, every stage that you go one by one, only one reality exists. You cannot experience two realities. And we make one reality by making other experiences unreal, no matter higher or lower. But when you reach the top, all are unreal and all are real because they're all occurring at the same place. They're all occurring within totality of consciousness. Therefore, we have to shut off levels of reality to become enlightened. A perfect living master who walks amongst us, an like ordinary human being, he's aware of all realities at all times. A person who says, I had once an experience of the reality I want to share with you, is not a perfect living master. If somebody says, I can go in and tell you what it is happening, not a perfect living master. A perfect living master knows what is happening to all levels of realities at all times, even when he is walking as an ordinary physical person, acting like a physical person here. When you go within, he's acting like a physical astral person there. If you go higher, he's there. How does he manifest in ourselves as a disciple of a perfect living master? Because he does a physical little ritual, a physical action which says, I accept you as my friend, let's go home together. When he says that, he has actually manifested in our higher levels of awareness. And we can go and check it out. He'll be there. This process of his saying, I accept you, I've come for you, is called initiation by a master. We call it initiation. It's a common word that has been used now. Initiation does not mean teaching us how to do meditation. Some people think like that. I'll tell you a true story. A very poor man living in an Indian village had a dream, a glimpse of a white bearded man who came and said, I know your time has come, come to me. And he checked with some of the other people in the village. They said, that is a, that's a master, Baba Savan Singh you saw. And he is in a particular dera and so far away. He said, I want to go and see him. I saw him. He called me. In the dream he called me. I must, he must be real that he's called me. I have to go. He had no money to buy even a bus ticket to go there. He took a few pieces of clothing that he had tied up in a bag and he began to walk. And he walked and he walked for almost several days, maybe a month, to reach the great master's house. The day he reached, I was standing outside. This is my experience, that's why I'm sharing with you. I was standing outside, young boy, and great master had just come out of his door to walk 
towards the garden. And we were just holding our hand like we traditionally did in front there. And this poor man comes and he looks at great master, all full of dust and all that. And he throws his little bag and runs to him. He says, master, give me Nam Dawn, give me initiation. And great master says, what, once again? He's seeing him for the first time. And he says, what, once again? Then he said, oh, you mean the formality. We'll do it tomorrow. Then we people got surprised. So just briefly he addressed us. He says he was initiated a month ago when he had a dream. This is just a formality, but I'm going to teach him how to meditate. That's for the mind. Meditation for the mind. The love had pulled him and brought him here. So when we are ready, the arrangement is so made that initiation is not a method of meditation. Initiation is acceptance by that enlightened person of the highest order who says, your time has come. You wanted me to come. I've come to take you back home. That's what real initiation means. So enlightenment has different meanings. And true enlightenment is when you attain the state of totality of consciousness and know everything at all times at once. One more question. I feel like I'm lim I am in limbo in life. Nothing seems to be working out. How would you recommend I deal with disappointments in life without getting frustrated? I feel like I am in limbo in life. Nothing seems to be working out. How would you recommend I deal with disappointments in life without getting frustrated? I have a simple solution if you can follow it. Don't have any expectations. Do you know if you have no expectations, you can never get disappointed? <laughs> That's the secret. Why do we have expectations? What for? Expectations lead to disappointment. No expectations ever come out all true. They are never fulfilled. You're creating the ground for disappointments and frustration yourself by expecting to start with. Instead of expectation, instead of expecting, change it to accepting. Accept rather than expect. If you accept that life comes as it will, and no amount of expectation is going to change it. If you accept life as it comes, you will have no frustration, you will have no disappointments. Thank you very much for giving so much attention, and I'm very happy to see you again. We'll see you next month.